All right. Welcome, everyone, to He's Done It, a mostly sports podcast. I'm Corey Novotny, and I'm joined this week, as always, by my co-host, Brian Wells. And we are back to our regularly scheduled programming after the past couple weeks of releasing 2021 NFL Season Preview Series episodes. We'll wrap up our season preview talk for the NFL with our playoffs and award predictions. Before getting into other sports, we'll talk some college football, some European football, and basketball, baseball, golf, lots of sports, and even some non-sports topics. We'll talk about Kanye West and Drake, who both released new albums within the last week or so. We'll give our takes on the Netflix reboot, He's All That. Finally, we'll wrap up the show as uh, we look ahead to the start of the NFL season by counting down our top five favorite weeks of the year. Where does the NFL week one stand up against other 51 weeks throughout the year? You'll have to stick around for the whole episode to find out. So with that, let's get started. back to our normal schedule we had been releasing our 2021 nfl season preview series over the past couple weeks so definitely go back and listen to those before it's too late and the season starts Uh, we'll get into this one by talking about a lot of stuff outside of the nfl kind of catch up on some of the sports topics and non-sports topics that we've missed on the past couple weeks we'll get started with the nfl though and we're going to talk about your team real quickly before we get into playoff and awards predictions. Somewhat of a surprise, the New England Patriots announced that Cam Newton was released and Mac Jones will be the week one starting quarterback. Now, you've long stated your disdain for Cam Newton as a Patriots quarterback at this point in his career. Uh, you know, Before that, the, the first question I have to ask is, based on what you've seen this offseason, do you think it is the right move to go with Mac Jones in week one? Yes, it is. I I wasn't a huge fan of the Mac Jones pick at the time, but after seeing how he's performed in the preseason and hearing how he's done in training camp, I'll admit I, I'm definitely a lot more confident in Mac Jones heading into week one than I was when they drafted him. I mean, when they drafted him, compared to the other four quarterbacks that were drafted in the first round, not only does he have the least amount of mobility, but he might not have also the least amount of arm strength compared to the other four guys. I mean, especially now, uh, given how the NFL is today, I feel like mobility is at the quarterback position is just as important as it used to be years ago. I mean, I know Tom Brady was the quarterback for 20 years and he obviously is not a mobile quarterback, but I feel like he was an an anomaly. And again, I feel like uh, the, the quarterback position today is trending towards guys who have mobility. And so Mac Jones, yeah, I'll admit the physical tools I question, but he he's definitely an accurate quarterback. He's very poised in the pocket, great decision maker in the pocket as well. A uh, good pre snap. He 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 knows how to play the position. I mean, a lot of times when quarterbacks get drafted in the first round, athletic ones, they always get talked about. Oh, he's got all the physical tools, but can he learn to play to play the position? Mac Jones, it's the opposite. I I'm I have full confidence that he can run the offense and throw accurately and make great decisions. That's what the Patriots definitely value at that position. My question with Mac Jones is, can he stay healthy for 17 games uh, in a NFL season? I mean, you've seen that picture with him with a sh- without a shirt after the national <laughs> yeah. championship game, uh, and and he's already wearing a knee brace. So that's what I worry more about Mac Jones is the physical stuff rather than learning how to play the position. Because people have been saying that he's NFL ready, and I I definitely see it, and I, I agree with those analysts who have said 
for a while now that that he's NFL ready. Yeah, I, I understand the idea of wanting a young mobile quarterback. Like, you know, Big Ben has had his moments where he's shown that, but I would much rather have a guy like have his successor be someone who is that kind of like you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be Lamar Jackson, but more in like the Justin Fields, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, where they can pass the ball, but they're not just a statue in the pocket. So I, I understand that. Uh, I said that I thought the, the Patriots had a better chance of making the playoffs with Cam Newton as their quarterback. Um, I, I still think that their floor would be higher with him, but I do think that Mac Jones has a higher ceiling just because you kind of know what you have with Cam Newton, what you saw last year. Like you think, okay, maybe can be better on the right set of 500 but mac jones like there is that kind of excitement factor to having a rookie quarterback come in so i get that um by all accounts this offseason he's definitely taken advantage of opportunities he's had uh and then one question i have for you i know this has also been kind of debated a lot is do you think that this plays out the way it does if cam newton was vaccinated in terms of him being released straight up by the team that's a good question because i believe that him getting released with being unvaccinated i think it was a factor but i don't think it was the factor does that make sense so i guess just in the sense that like you don't you think that he was he was beat out by jones for the starting job yeah i do believe even though cam newton he actually did play reasonably well in the preseason i mean he didn't do much versus washington but i thought in the philly game i thought both guys were great in the philly game now i know they're playing against second and third stringers but still i thought I thought Cam Newton looked reasonably good uh, versus Philly, and then Mac Jones was just better. I I, just, I don't I don't think Cam Newton was that bad in the preseason. I thought he'd fine. I just think Mac Jones was exceeding all expectations so far. Yeah, and I guess in the case of Cam being unvaccinated, I think that it totally makes sense that Bill and any other coach, GM, whatever, would not want to have their backup quarterback be a liability because that's. I mean, for someone who's not going to see the field, you don't want that to be the reason that you're, you know, have a game just go off the rails because they, you know, expose the starting quarterback to COVID and they end up missing a game or two because of it. I mean, I was on the longest broken record ever with Cam Newton saying that I don't think he can play. Uh, he, I don't think he could be a starting quarterback in the league anymore. And he, I mean, he hasn't even been signed since he's been released. So I, it's kind of telling that. A lot of teams or pretty much every team in the league doesn't really believe in Cam Newton either anymore. But I've also been on the longest broken record saying that Cam Newton came off as a really nice guy and very refreshing to listen to in press conferences. So I never questioned his personality. But I will admit, uh, with the being unvaccinated and reports of him not being able to pick up the playbook as well and apparently mac jones had to teach him some stuff in the playbook oh, i don't know wow. if you heard about that but no i didn't yeah there was a por- report saying that from rob ninkovich former patriot saying that that cam newton had to be taught uh by mac jones on some things in the playbook and so i kind of question maybe cam newton's leadership heading into the year because if he is unvaccinated and he doesn't know the playbook as well as a rookie quarterback when he's been in the system for one for one year, did he just think that he was just going to waltz in and just be the automatic starting QB? That that element, I sort of question. Yeah, which is interesting to hear because I think that his leadership, like some of the reports you were hearing, was a big reason why the Patriots brought him back this season, and like there was optimism that he could be um, much more improved in a you know this 2021 season than he was in 2020. I don't think that Cam Newton will end up being signed anytime soon. Uh, I think if a team gets kind of desperate at the quarterback situation, they will. But I don't know that there's a team that's going to bring him in just to be the backup quarterback just in case at this time. He seemed Um, like... I do think the vaccine status is a big part of that. Yeah, definitely. And he seemed like someone that was willing to do what the coaches were telling telling him to do. So it seemed like he was a good soldier or, or a good teammate, but... I wonder if that him being a starter had to play into that because if I don't know if he wants to be a backup at all because I feel like that's yeah. the only way he could get a job again is if he's a backup somewhere whether if it's in Dallas or Seattle or wherever. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of careers get cut short because guys just aren't given the same kind of opportunities they've been used to, and they don't want to take a lesser role, Um, especially in a sport like football that's as brutal as it is. Like some of these guys have made enough, they've accomplished enough in their careers. uh, You know, they're not just gonna take a any opportunity that's handed to them. They want what they want is best for them. So right. All right. So with that, let's uh, let's give our playoff predictions for the season we did give bold predictions for each division most of ours did not have to do with actual playoff picks though so brian i'll let you get started we'll go through the afc just give us your four division winners and your three wild cards as well as your eventual conference champion who will go to the super bowl all right so my four division winners uh are the chiefs the browns the bills and the uh what what which one? Oh, the South, yes. uh, the Titans. Uh, shows you how much confidence I have in the South, AFC South division. If I forget <laughs> what division. <laughs> yeah, eight and nine. Yeah, eight and nine. Eight and nine Titans, yeah. Uh, and then the wild card teams, I'm obviously big on the Chargers. And then I have the Ravens and the Dolphins. And so the, the one team that I have out that I really thought a lot about was, of course, <laughs> New England Patriots with Mac Jones starting if he can start all 17 games I honestly think that they have a chance at being going 10 and 7 this year and when you go 10 and 7 that could that could get you in the playoffs that could not uh that could force you to be eliminated as well because we saw last year the Bears made it at 8 and 8 but the Dolphins they were eliminated when they went 10 and 6 so it would not surprise me whatsoever if the Patriots make the playoffs. I have, because Mac Jones is now starting, I, I'll admit, I have more confidence in th- th- this Patriots team now, now that they have a quarterback that can get them the the players the ball and they have a little bit more weapons. And I mean, I do have some questions for sure if I have them out of the playoffs. I, I mean, I have questions about, again, how good their weapons are, even though they signed a lot of players. I mean, I don't I don't love Nelson Aguilar and Kendrick Bourne. And then uh, defensively, they will miss Gilmore for the first 16. So there are some concerns, but I'll admit, I have more confidence in them now that Mac Jones is a starter. But I'll admit, I had to leave him out because the other seven teams, I do believe in more than the Patriots. But again, wouldn't surprise me if they do make it. Uh, yeah. yeah, the AFC is tough this year. Um, I similar line of thinking but maybe different teams uh so afc east i have the bills afc south the titans afc west the chiefs all three of those teams repeating and the afc north i'm going with the baltimore ravens with the steelers as a wild card i made that prediction last year and it worked out well in my favor with the Steelers actually winning the north kind of hoping for something similar again uh but basically i i think that the ravens have a higher floor than the Steelers do which is why i'm going with them to win the north uh, other wild cards i know you're high on the chargers i'm high on the broncos one of us is probably going to look like an idiot if not both of us um uh, i don't know who that's going to be no, I, i'm then, glad i'm glad that you're picking the broncos it sounds like you're more confident in them and it sounds like of course i was more confident in the chargers so i'm glad we're yeah going. teddy bridgewater is a starting quarterback uh i do think that he's going to have enough success uh with the the talent around him on both sides of the ball to get denver into the postseason and then I'm also going with the Dolphins over the Patriots. I've been back and forth on those two. Ultimately, what it comes down to is just having enough confidence in Tua Tagovailoa because I think that's going to be a difference maker. If he can come in and play well, like you said, you think he's going to go to the Pro Bowl this season. If he plays like that, Miami's going to the playoffs. He's not winning MVP, but I'll admit, I I definitely think he can make the Pro Bowl. And I think, I really think he can make a big leap this year. I just think that when it was his last year in college and heading into the draft, I thought people were too high on Tua. But now after one year, I mean, a half a year, not even a full year, a half a year of Tua. Everyone thinks he sucks now. And I'm just, I, it went from being too high, people being too high on him to now, I think people are too low on him. And I think he can prove people wrong this year. Yeah, he's coming off a huge injury, you know, making a transition to the NFL, playing with an offensive coordinator who is designed for the guy he was taking over exactly. for. So I do think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic about Tua this year. Um, you want to switch over to the NFC now? All right, so my division winners are the Bucks, the Packers, um, the Rams, and the Cowboys. Uh, yeah, I know I'm going with the Cowboys again. They're, they're not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna pick them to make the Super Bowl again, uh, but I definitely think they can win the 
uh, NFC East. And then the wild card teams, I got two in the same division. I got the Niners and the Seahawks. I, I think that division is stacked and I know the Niners weren't great as weren't that great last year, and I don't expect them to do what they did two years ago. But I definitely think they'll bounce back and perform better than they did last year, especially with all the injuries that they had last season. And yeah, so I have the Niners, the Seahawks, and the football team. All right. Uh, so we have six of the seven the same. All four division winners: Cowboys, Packers, Bucks, Rams for me. 49ers and Seahawks both making it from the NFC West. And uh, the only difference is I have the Saints. I believe in Teddy Bridgewater. I believe in their offense. Or not Teddy Bridgewater. And Jameis Winston. I believe in their offense and their defense. I think that they were the most talented team in football last year. And, um, you know, while I expect them to take a drop off after losing some of that talent, I think, think I still think they have enough to edge out teams like Washington, Minnesota, Arizona for that final playoff spot. So before we... Uh, started recording I told you that in the AFC and NFC there were eight teams in each conference that I really believed in and I had to I was forced to leave one team out in the AFC it was the Patriots and the NFC it was the Vikings I do like the Vikings a lot I think they'll have a winning record I think they can go nine and eight or ten and seven but again I I can only pick seven teams the other seven teams I believe in more and just nitpicking, I, I'll admit, I, I'm a little bit concerned about the chemistry between Mike Zimmer and Kirk Cousins, especially if Kirk is definitely an anti-vaxxer, as it, as it seems. So, I'll admit, total nitpicking, but whatever. Hey, I mean, that is legitimate. It could be like, you know, that could be the difference. a couple games where and, and, It's not only them. Kirk, but it's also Adam Thielen. And both of them, if they were to ever miss a game, that could be the difference between winning winning and losing one or two games, and that could be the difference of not making the playoffs. Yep, absolutely. All right, so real quickly, before we wrap up the uh, playoff predictions, let's go ahead and give our Super Bowl representatives from the AFC and the NFC. So I, I know that I'm big on the Browns, but I do agree with you and Brian that at some point the Browns will be the Browns. I just think that they'll make a deeper run than you guys. And so because of that, I'm going with the Chiefs at the AFC. I, as much as I want to pick the Browns, I'll admit. Yeah, at some point <laughs> they will. Very exciting pick. There. At some point they will be the Browns. And yeah, I'm going to go straight up chalk in the AFC. And in the AFC, yeah, I'm going to go straight up chalk again. And I'm going to go with the Bucks. The team that I think they'll beat, though, will be the Rams. I do like the Rams a lot in the regular season. Uh, and But I'll admit, I just have some questions about can Matthew Stafford really uh, take the Rams to the promised land and, and get them to the Super Bowl? I'll admit, we haven't seen Matthew Stafford a lot in the postseason. And I think the Bucks, especially Tom Brady, have definitely more postseason experience. So I'm going to go with the Chiefs and the Bucks, just like last year, and I'm going to go with the same winner as well. I'm going to go with the Bucks. I know it's total bias, but I think they're equipped to win it all again. They brought back all their starters, and they're 100% vaccinated, which means that they believe that they can repeat, and I certainly think they can. And I don't think – I don't want to predict it, but I don't. I think 20-0 is possible. I don't think it's likely, but I, I think there's some chance of it happening. So I'm going to go Bucks over Chiefs, just prediction. like last year. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm i also going with the Chiefs and the AFC and the NFC. I'm going with the team you have, the runner-up, the Los Angeles Rams. I'm all in on them this season. And uh, yeah, second straight season where they're going to have a Super Bowl host site with the host team in it. So uh, we got to see those two teams three years ago in that Just stadium. Light it up. One of the best regular season games, 54-51. to 51. I believe it went to overtime too. So... I don't, That's I the don't one thing know. I'm trying I don't to think I don't it, it did. Was, I, I, it it was might just, have. I think the Chiefs were close. Yeah, like they I had think it was a, a just so high end. scoring that it yeah. seemed like it did. But no, I think it was, I think it was fifty four fifty one. Yeah, fifty four fifty one. That would be incredible if we get another. Uh, oh, that'd be a wildly like entertaining that in the Super Bowl. game <laughs> if that yeah. were to happen. Uh, obviously, I'm, I'm still going to root for Brady and the Bucks, but that could be a good consolation. Uh, if if the Bucks weren't to make it, I as as bold as I'd love to be when it came to the Super Bowl, I'm just like you know what these are the two teams that I truly believe in, and so I have to go with the talk. Yeah. I'm sure it won't happen, but I can't help it. Those are the two teams that I. Whenever I try to go really bold, it doesn't work out all that well. So I uh, I get just wanting to stick with it, and hey, I mean, it doesn't happen to me. Like everyone else picked it. So. I mean, yeah, like I don't. <laughs> obviously, I went too bold with some of my predictions. I stand by most of them. The only one I don't stand by. Now is the Camara one 
that one's obviously dumb, especially since I thought I was going to be Taysom starting instead of Jameis. But now that, because it's Jameis, I definitely feel a lot better about Kamara's. And that is one of the risks we took with recording yeah. those, um, you know, as early as we did. Yeah, that but, is very true. Uh, let's move on and let's uh, wrap up the NFL talk with our award predictions. And let's start with the most valuable player of the league. So there are two guys that I'm kind of stuck with when it comes to the MVP war. Both of these are long shots. So it's not Rodgers or Mahomes or Josh Allen. One of them is kind of a long shot. He's like 20 to 1 in the betting market. And then the other one's like 40 to 1. So one's a kind of a long shot. The other one's a true long shot. The first one is Matt. your actual prediction? So the, uh, that's right, what I'm... No, you can continue. You're fine. <laughs> Tell us what... the best value MVP bet instead. <laughs> well, there are two guys that I'm flip-flopping between. One of them is Matthew Stafford. I, I'm, I'm obviously I question what you can do in the postseason, but in the regular season, now I have no doubts that he's going to light it up, especially being with the one of the best offensive minded coaches in the league and having a great duo and Cooper Cup, who I'm obviously high on, and Bobby Trees, <laughs> another name for Robert <laughs> Woods, uh. and live, being in an LA, I imagine it'll be great for him. The other guy I'm flip flopping between is with Stafford is Baker Mayfield, as crazy as that sounds. Okay. I, I mean, if the Browns are as good as you think they'll yeah. be, they'll definitely be in the conversation. Yeah, I I, I love I love the Browns this year. But I, I'm not to make the Super Bowl, but I'm definitely high on them. I think they can even get a one seed. I think that's possible. And because you're all, all in on the Rams, that's my tiebreaker. I'll go with Baker Mayfield. <laughs> I, I really do believe in the, the coach chemistry that him and Stefanski have and having the best O line, the best running back duo, good receivers and Odell and Landry. I think getting Odell back is obviously important, not only because he's their number one receiver, but because they only had him for four games last year. And I feel like outside of that Cowboys game in the beginning of last season, I feel like the Browns got off to a sort of a slow start on offense, but I feel like they started to really figure things out. Uh, at the end of last season going into the postseason against Pittsburgh and parts of the Kansas City game. And so I think that momentum can only continue into this season. And I, I, I'm i going to pick Baker. I know it's a dumb pick, but two, super long shot, but I'm going to go with Baker Mayfield. Yeah, I mean, we've had a lot of long shot candidates and winners in recent years, so I really don't think that's that crazy of a pick. Um I am going with Matthew Stafford. Yeah. Like I said, I'm all in on the Rams. I <laughs> predicted he would lead the league in passing yards. I think that he's going to ultimately win the MVP award because I think it'll be the difference between the Rams the past couple seasons since their Super Bowl team where they were, eh, you know, last year good enough to make the playoffs as a wild card to this year being back into Super Bowl contention status. And I think Stafford's going to be the reason why. And that's why he's going to win MVP. It's a good choice. Right. That's the guy I was flip flopping <laughs> between. So. Yeah, hey, you know, I'm glad that you went with Mayfield. I don't know yeah. if you knew that Stafford was coming there, but it works out. Have some variety here. Yeah. Uh, all right. So now let's go ahead and with our offensive and defensive players of the year. All right. So for offensive player of the year, I'm going to go with McCaffrey. Unlike the MVP award, when it comes to offensive player of the year, running backs can win the award. I know Adrian Peterson won MVP, but outside of him, it's really. A I don't cute. think anyone's won since. Right? Yeah. I think it. Yeah. It's just straight up. A quarterback award and so for offensive player of the year running backs definitely can win this award i'm gonna go with mccaffrey he's definitely of course one of the best offensive players in the league he's i'd imagine the consensus number one overall pick in fantasy drafts and i know he only played three games last year but he was incredible in those three games that he did play and i feel like he can put up pretty similar stats uh in a throughout a 17 game season and Especially, and with Darnold being there, I think that can only help because he loves throwing to the slot. And McCaffrey, I know he's a running back, but whenever he lines up at the receiver, he lines up, of course, in the slot. And so I'd imagine McCaffrey not only will pull up insane rushing numbers, but he'll put up insane pass catching, pass catching numbers as well. And so, yeah, he does it all. If he's healthy, then he's yeah. definitely going to be in the conversation. Everybody's picking him for this one. And and I'll go with my d- defense now. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Uh, and then defensive player of the year, uh, I'm going to go with Miles Garrett. Uh, I feel like it's an award that can go to pass rushers more than corners. Three of the last four have gone to Aaron Donald, so maybe he's just the one guy that can really do it. But I think Miles Garrett is entering entering his prime, given how dominant he is and how good I think the Browns can be this year. I think he has 
a legit shot of winning the defensive player of the year and putting up great numbers. And I'm sure Aaron Donald will be just as good and maybe it'll probably be him, but just to be different, I think Miles Garrett can put up uh he I think he can be a similar force uh to Aaron Donald. Uh Aaron Donald uh in Cleveland than he is with the Rams. So yeah, I'm gonna go with Miles Garrett. I feel like Donald was just given the award just because of who he is. So, I, so I don't even know though, he's going to do it again. I, I, yeah, I know there's may, probably some Stewart's bias, but I do kind of agree. Yeah. I thought TJ Watt should have uh, definitely had a legit shot of winning the award last year, and I'm kind of surprised that he didn't, and they just gave it to Donald again. Yeah, so my Offensive Player of the Year uh, kind of go a little off uh, the beaten path instead of McCaffrey. I'm going to go with Alvin Kamara, who it sounds like you're warming on. If the Saints are going to be good, Kamara's going to be a huge part yeah. of it. And I also just recently drafted him in one of my fantasy leagues, so oh, that's, that's nice. I have a little bit of bias uh, you know, wanting him to be that kind of player. I should have just um, picked Aaron Jones then. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, th- I think that Kamara is going to be huge in both the rushing game and the passing game. I think having Jameis Winston as a starting quarterback is going to help. No Michael Thomas either, so be more on Kamara this year I understand some reasons for concern with that but ultimately I think the Saints offense is going to be better than it was last year as a whole um, with Drew Brees and his uh, I just had inconsistencies I just had way more concern that it was going to be I I know I'm a Taysom guy but I know deep down he's not exactly a pocket passer (laughs) and the, the games that he started in Kamara was not he was not productive at all oh not at all and so so that's why that's why I was crazy with that take uh weeks ago but now that's winston and after seeing how he performed in the preseason and seeing how callaway has performed i think that'll only make their offense better and so yeah yeah i'm obviously warming up to camara uh now that's Jameis, and yeah their offenses i'd imagine will still be pretty good yeah, and for Defensive Player of the Year, a different pass rusher from the 2017 draft class. Third time's a charm. I'm going to go with TJ Watt. I'm going to keep picking him until he wins the award. Uh, I will admit I'm a little concerned that he is, uh, you know, in his holdout type state. It sounds like he's going to play with or without a contract. I don't understand why the Steelers haven't locked him up yet, why they're afraid to give him money and, you know, break from tradition if it means uh giving him more guarantees to keep him around but he is a very productive player on the field and i think the sealers are going to really need the defense to play at a high level and tj watt has he's been up there two years in a row um you can make a case that he should have won it last year for sure i think that this is year he finally gets it the only reason why i sort of disagree with that pick is just because he didn't win it last year if he didn't win it last year uh, yeah I, I he's got to put up yeah. even bigger numbers than he did yeah last and I, I think that the I'm I'm curious how the NFL handles holding penalties because last year their holding penalties were at a record low and that's why his you know he led the league in sacks but it wasn't like a crazy number so I think that'll play a factor as well. Um, all right, you want to go with our offensive and defensive rookies of the year now? Yeah, so for offensive rookie of the year, another one where I'm debating between two guys, Trey Lance and Justin Fields. Two guys that are rookie, of course, rookie quarterbacks who are not starting in week one. Uh-huh. And I'm going to go with Justin Fields because with the Niners, I at least believe in Jimmy Garoppolo is a competent quarterback. And I think he can have the starting job for some period of time. But when it comes to the Bears, I, 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 I Andy, Andy Dalton blows. <laughs> I, I don't, <laughs> yeah. Eventually, they're going to go to Fields uh, sooner rather than later. I, I, I can't imagine them going to Dalton for that long, especially when you got two guys, the GM and the coach, being on the super duper hot seat right now. So I'll go with Fields just because I think he'll get in there uh, quicker. And the Bears don't have to be good. I mean, Justin Herbert last year, the, the Chargers went seven and nine, and he was still great, and he won Rookie of the Year. I can totally see Fields being like Deshaun Watson with Houston, where the the where the Texans there weren't they're never really that great, but Watson's doing everything, and I can see that with Fields where the Bears are mediocre, but Fields is just carrying the team. And so I'm going to go with Justin Fields for offense. Yeah, and Kyler Murray won Rookie of the Year in 2019 with like a 5-10-1 record. Right, so, another yeah, great You definitely team. don't need to win. You don't um, need to – your team doesn't need to be good. You just need to put up great numbers. Yeah. Being a quarterback definitely helps. Uh, as much as I want to go with Najee Harris for the Steelers, Josh Jacobs – had a very strong case and he still lost out to Kyler Murray a couple years ago. So I'm going to go quarterback Lance and fields are guys where if they get in there early, they'd be ones I would go with, but I 
don't want to bank on that happening. So to me, it really comes down to the other three guys who are week one starters. And I'm going to go with the number one overall pick, Trevor Lawrence. I think that the Jaguars are going to be better than they were last season. And I think that Lawrence is going to be a big part of that. And voters are going to reward, uh, you know, Lawrence maybe overachieving in some ways. And uh, I think he played really well in that final preseason game to kind of prove that he is ready for this. So he's my offensive rookie of the year. Also, I just realized we skipped over your defensive rookie of the year, so I guess we should have no, just that's fine. kept I, them I, separate. I, that's fine, yeah. <laughs> uh, for defensive rookie of the year, I'm going to go with Micah Parsons. I just think that his his impact will make the Cowboys' defense a lot better. They're not going to be an elite defense, but they can't be as bad as they were last year. And, so, and being a linebacker, I think, uh, definitely helps as well because I think it's a little bit harder for corners to win. And with J.C. Horn and Patrick Sertan... Uh, yeah, they're corners, and they're on teams that I don't believe in as much in terms of playoff success or, or making it to the playoffs. And Micah Parsons on the Cowboys, I certainly think Dallas can make the playoffs, and he will. Being a middle linebacker or outside linebacker, wh- whichever one, I- I'd imagine he's a middle linebacker. He's a middle linebacker. Yeah, I figured. Yeah. I- I'd imagine he'll pull up. He'll have uh, plenty of tackles and make a green impact. So I'm gonna go with him. Yeah, um, I'm also going with Parsons. As much as I wanted to go with either Horn or Sertan, I agree with you. Linebacker over corner. Not even just that. He plays for the Dallas Cowboys. If the Cowboys are good this year, it's because their defense has improved. And Parsons, their first round pick, is a big part of that. So um, I think just you know that factor alone. It's same thing kind of with going to quarterback, going with a linebacker for the Dallas Cowboys seems like a safer, more likely pick here. Exactly. All right, and then finally, let's go with our coach of the year. Oh, comeback player. Oh, sorry. Comeback player of the year. First. So Dak Prescott is the favorite, and I'm going to go with Dak Prescott. I just think that given how gruesome his injury was last season and how high I am on the Cowboys this year, I think he definitely has a great chance of winning comeback player of the year. And it's not just because of his injury. He's definitely been through a lot over the past year. He lost his brother due to depression and so he's been through a ton in his life when it comes to family related stuff as well as injury related uh cases. So I think Dak Prescott is definitely a he's a deserving favorite for this award. Yeah, it's definitely a chalk pick, but unless he gets hurt again, it's hard to envision Dak not winning comeback player of the year. I mean, last year Alex Smith was kind of handed it when he walked on the field. You don't have anyone in that situation. And honestly, Dak's probably the closest coming back from the injury he did. Uh, Christian McCaffrey is probably up there given he was limited in games played. There are probably a few other guys you could point to, but Dak seems like the you know obvious answer here. And it's hard to not pick him when you think the Cowboys are going to make the playoffs. Yeah. All right, now let's do Coach of the Year. Wrap it up. So another word where I was debating between two guys, one of them, Brian Flores. I'm obviously a fan of his when he was with the Patriots, and I think he's done a great job in his first couple of seasons with the Dolphins. But the reason why I'm not going to go with him is because I feel like for him to win the award, the Dolphins have to win 13 or 14 games, and I don't think that is possible. I be, Just given that he won 10 games last year, I I just – I I don't think it's possible for him to win the award unless if they are like a one seed. And so my pick is going to be Brandon Staley of the Chargers. I can see something similar with what Kevin Stefanski did last season, but making a bigger impact defensively than offensively. And I mean, the, you know, the, the Browns were, I think, a 6-10 and 10 team the year before, and they made it all the way to the divisional round. Uh, last season. And I can see something similar where the Chargers, they went 7-9 and nine last season, and I Obviously, as a bold take, I am taking him to make it all the way to the divisional round. So I can see similarities in that. And so I'm going with Brandon Staley. Yeah, he definitely has potential as a first year head coach. That's uh, certainly something that you kind That's of. That's a popular trend a as well. Yeah, first year head steps coaches. In, takes them to the playoffs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't have any first year head coaches in the playoffs this year. So the guy I'm going to go with is someone who I, I think is going to benefit from uh, my MVP pick. And that's Sean McVay with the Rams. I think that, uh, you know, the past couple of seasons, people have kind of been down on McVay. Like, oh, the, she, the Rams haven't been as good. Should all these teams be uh, hiring in the McVay mold still? I think that, you know, you give Stafford to McVay this offense is going to take off and McVay is going to be rewarded of of course I believe in that I mean he's had he's done he's had all the success he's had with Goff yeah yeah (laughs) 
Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly believe that Safford is a big upgrade. It's a, and, uh, it's a miracle that, that what he's that'll done. That'll be huge so, for him. So, yeah, I'm, I'm with you there that McVeigh can definitely be in the running as well. All right, that'll wrap up our NFL talk until next week when we'll have games to talk about. Uh, let's start talking about, talking about some other sports or at least starting off with some other leagues. Let's talk about the college game because week one did start last week. Just kind of go through some highlights from some of the big games from week one, uh, starting with Thursday night, Ohio State, Minnesota. So <laughs> Ohio State's down 14 to 10 at halftime. Everyone's thinking, oh, Minnesota might pull off a comeback. CJ Stroud making his first start, really struggling. I think he was at like 65 passing yards at halftime. What does he do? He throws four touchdown passes in the second half. Ohio State pulls it out 45-31. to 31. And Quinn Ewers, who reclassified, is uh, not going to be rushed in just yet. So um, Ohio State certainly off to a great start with that one. I have no thoughts on, on that game. I... <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Um, so Friday night, so Sam Howell, you familiar with him? He's up there as one of the top quarterback prospects. Uh, as long as he's North not, Carolina. as long as he's better than Trubisky, I'm, I'm sure he'll, <laughs> I'm well, sure he'll be his, fine. His first game this year, North Carolina had huge expectations, number 10 in the country, 17 for 32, 208 yards, one touchdown, three picks. North Carolina loses Virginia Tech 17 to 10, doesn't score a single point in the first half. Not off so, to a good start for him then. <laughs> no, not off to a great start for Howell. Um, I do think that he's going to turn it around. I wasn't shocked that North Carolina lost, but I certainly was not expecting them to lose in the way they did uh, with that few point total. Are they a ranked so, team or? Are they yeah, they're number 10. They were number yeah, 10. Okay. They okay. were number 10. Yeah. I don't know where they are anymore, but they certainly had expectations heading into the season. Okay. So Saturday, um, a lot of action, I guess, starting in the noon game. So I, I feel terrible for Tulane, their students, their school, you know, and have everything that's happened with Hurricane Ida. Uh, and part of that, I also feel bad that they didn't get to watch uh, Oklahoma come into town. I think that would have been a huge game for uh, you know the fans in New Orleans at Tulane Stadium. It had to be moved to Norman because of the hurricane. And then they end up going out and they almost beat Oklahoma, forty to thirty five final. They had ball around midfield with a chance to go for a winning score. So Oklahoma, and, and the Oklahoma number two team in the country, and Oklahoma's yeah, a top five team in the country, and they have a, yep. a possible Heisman candidate. And Rattler. Yeah, Spencer Rattler. Yeah, he's right up there with Howell. He, he ended up playing better than Howell. He wasn't spectacular. He had one passing touchdown, one rushing touchdown, also had two picks, but he at least threw for 300 yards. So I'd imagine that um, would have been a big upset, one of the biggest, probably the biggest I all think, year, I'd imagine. I'm pretty sure Oklahoma was like a 31 point favorite. So uh, definitely would have been a gigantic would that upset. Have, would that have been as big of an upset as. I don't know if you remember, but the Appalachian State, uh, Michigan, Michigan game. Yeah, I don't know what the point spread was on that one, but I, I mean, App, App State was an FCS school, so I think that that's still like the the staple for a big upset. I think everyone remembers that one. Oh, I, re- I, I don't even watch college football, <laughs> and I remember that. <laughs> yeah, uh, Alabama. A lot of questions with them coming into the season. Uh, new starting quarterback in Bryce Young. He only threw, I think, thirty passes last year in relief of Mac Jones. They're no more Najee Harris. They lost some of their big receivers, Jalen Waddle and Devontae Smith, who won the Heisman Trophy. My brother was actually saying, oh, yeah, Alabama, they're so inexperienced now. They're favored by 19 points. I'm taking Miami in this one. I was like, Cam, I don't think you want to do that. Like Every time I've said a team can cover a spread against Bama when it's like that big, they end up doubling it. What happens? Bama rolls 44 to 13. <laughs> That's funny. They got off to a twenty-seven nothing start before Miami crossed midfield. It it's so Just unfair a, how good Alabama is, and yep. I don't care. I don't care how many relatives I have from Alabama and went to the University of, of Alabama. I still I'm still gonna root against them. They're just they're <laughs> way too good. It's so unfair. And it, and la- last year especially, the, they blow out Notre Dame and was it the Rose Bowl? Yeah, it was the I think it was the yeah. Rose Bowl, and yeah, it and was then in the Rose Bowl, and then they blow out Ohio State, and it, it wasn't even a, after one half, it was already over in both of those games, and I just and I saw parts of that game uh, this weekend, and it wasn't even a contest. No, they're always so dominant. You know, if if they beat Clemson, then it's great. Um, and, you know, outside of that, it, it is nice to have a, a new team up there, though. So we'll see if that happens this year. But after you know, one game, there's no reason to believe Alabama won't be as dominant as they normally are. Big game of the weekend. 
Number three, Clemson against number five, Georgia. We get 13 total points. 10 to three in this one. So <laughs> There was one touchdown. It wasn't even scored by the offense. No, it was a pick six. Yeah, yeah I saw that. I, hey, look, I don't like Georgia. They're my least favorite SEC team, but I hate Clemson way more. So I'm gonna, I am gonna. I had no issue rooting for Georgia, and I love that Clemson scored three points. They start the season 0-1, and uh, they've already dropped in the rankings. They're now down to number six. What did you do afterwards as a celebration? Did you do uh, I mean, uh, nothing nothing crazy i just was like just all right super nice. happy. this is cool well here's the thing it's like i'm happy about it but at the same time i'm like realistically they're gonna run the table against the acc they're gonna win the ac championship and they made the college football playoff anyway this is one you th- loss you, gonna you think they'll anything. still make the college football playoff even i if, still even do, if yeah even if their conference is complete trash yes i do think that they will because they're clemson and it's you know the reputation that they've gained yeah the, the repu the reputation definitely helps i think that for them to not make it, I mean, obviously Alabama will make the playoffs, but I think Oklahoma, Georgia, and Ohio State, I think those three teams would have to be well, undefeated for, for Clemson not to make it. Yeah, I mean, if, if Alabama and Is Georgia that are undefeated in the SEC championship know. game, yeah, I mean, none of them face each other. If Alabama and Georgia are undefeated in the SEC championship game, um, you know, one of them is one loss, and that's the only loss, then, yeah, that could be an edge, especially if it's Georgia who beat Clemson. But, yeah, I mean, that's probably what it would come down to because, you know, the ACC is not great, but the Big Ten and the... Um, Are much better. The Big 12, yeah, they're only so much better. Right. So I just, I think, just thinking about it, I think those are the four teams that would have to run the table for Clemson to not make it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they would have to certainly be up there. Um, Texas a and another one. Like, there, there's some other schools that could be into that picture, but that's... uh. It feels like it's still, uh, you know, Clemson's path to the playoffs is still there. This is a little off topic. How do you how do you feel about uh, Brian Kelly and the? Yeah, I did want to talk oh, about okay. that. I, mean, I was gonna kind of wait later, but yeah, we can jump into that right now. So Sunday night, Notre Dame, Florida State, you know, great game going to overtime. What did he say? Like he his team needs to be executed. Yeah, it it was a joke <laughs> from a past Bucks coach that. Uh, how do you how do you guys feel about execution? I'm in favor of it, you know, one way or the other. And yeah, Brian Kelly, yeah, I, he was trying to make a, a joke, but it was obviously it didn't come it, off. His execution well. of the joke yeah. was not very good. <laughs> yeah, I I agree with that. I mean, I'm not going to make a huge deal about it. Yeah, obviously, not, he's not being serious, like trying to kill. It, his it just got players, a lot of. But... He obviously got a lot of heat for it, and so that's why I thought about. Yeah, Brian. honestly, I think the biggest story of that game should be Mackenzie Milton. And him coming in and playing like him coming back from that injury where the doctor performed the surgery was like, I mean, it's not impossible, but I don't know anyone else has ever come back from that. They put him on a sports center top 10 place just for straight just, up just coming back just from a, a coming horrible injury, uh, yeah. missing two years of college football and and then coming back. And what school what school did he play for? Uh, he was at UCF. He UC- was a quarterback okay. the year where they were undefeated. Because when I when I was looking at the the highlights on sports center, when I saw his jersey, I'm like, that's that's not Florida State. And well, what, yeah. what school did he play for before? So that, yeah, that's a, that's a great it's, story. It's incredible how he came onto the field because the starting quarterback lost his helmet on a sack. Like I've never seen something like that happen before. And then he plays well enough, leads him on a scoring drive, and yeah, I'm sure that he's going to be the starting quarterback moving forward because the guy he replaced wasn't all that great, at least as a passer. Um, just a couple other ones that I want to get to. UCLA beats LSU in the Rose Bowl. Uh, shout out to LSU fans for draining the Rose Bowl of beer before kickoff. But your team, uh, you know, when are we going to get to the point where we can all sit back and say, yeah, Coach O is really nothing without Joe Brady. Like, that's the reason why they, him and Joe Burrow, they won the 2019 championship. He'd be an offensive line coach somewhere instead. I mean, I always say that Doug Peterson would not have any had any success whatsoever if, if Frank Reich weren't the offensive coordinator with Wentz uh, during their Super Bowl run. So I just think he's a goofy guy with or a, a guy, a useless guy with a goofy visor. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's, yeah, he's, he's a fun guy. I, uh, I do love Coach O, but it's, I, lo- uh, I love him in the blind side <laughs> in his yeah, one stint. Yeah. yeah sure. He seemed like, uh, he seems like a Ole cool Miss. uncle. Oh yeah. That, right? that, that'd and, be um, fun to talk with that at, at like, I, 
uh, when you're grilling or something. Yeah, I'm glad that he got his championship, but I think he's uh, starting to be exposed with the way LSU has played the past couple seasons. And the flip side, Chip Kelly, uh, UNH guy. So certainly happy to see him have success at UCLA because he's someone who's kind of on the hot seat by some accounts. So um, certainly it would be nice to see him have success there. And uh, there were a lot of FCS upsets this week. I think there were six but the biggest one, Montana beating number 20 Washington 13 to 7 in Seattle. So, not a great start for Washington in the Pac 12. Oregon barely beat Fresno State. So, the uh, Pac 12, it's looking like it's going to be another tough year for them and a long shot for them to send a team to the college football playoff, which I don't think they have done since Oregon went to the title game in 2014. One more oh, thing. no, Washington in 2016. One yeah. more thing to. Uh to bring up your school your football team yeah for sure what was uh what was their situation again with at quarterback (laughs) (laughs) yeah so um the starting quarterback was initially brought in to be an assistant coach like that's what i thought yeah but the the slated starting quarterback luke Doty got hurt and uh zeb nolan wound up winning the starting job and i know he's eastern illinois and fcs school but he looked great and uh gamecocks won 46 to nothing first shutout since 2008 i'm not gonna totally overreact to this one game but i'm certainly uh feeling optimistic about this team especially compared to the disaster that was last season no i i just so. i just love stuff like that i i always love when uh the zamboni driver in in hockey has yeah. to come in and play goalie in a pro hockey you know, game I, I love. You stuff don't like always that. love it when it's on your team, but I guess when it works out, it's pretty cool. Yeah, um, exactly. Thir- Thirteen for twenty-two, one hundred twenty-one yards, four touchdowns. So he definitely made some passes when he needed to. And then the third-string running backs, the Quandre Wright, one hundred twenty-eight rushing yards, thirty-nine receiving yards, two touchdowns. So I do think that the uh, the Gamecocks can be pretty solid, as well as the, the pass rush. It was awesome. They were talking about Jordan Birch, who was like a top ten recruit. Uh, heading into last season and talking about how he's been slow to you know come on and like make a statement and he immediately gets a pick six as a defensive lineman uh you know just catches it not even like on a tip he just straight up catches a ball that was intended to be a short pass and it just runs all the way for a touchdown i thought that was really cool so definitely uh excited about that great to couple the gamecocks win with the clemson loss that must have been the best weekend of college football for you. Yeah, for a very long time, yeah. Um, all right, let's let's uh, let's move on to some other sports, particularly some that we kind of miss in the past couple of weeks because we haven't been releasing new content, uh, or at least not you know new content other than NFL. And uh, all right, there are two types of people in this world. Would you agree? Sure, maybe, yeah. <laughs> Messi fans and Ronaldo fans. Oh yeah, definitely. I'm I'm definitely a Messi guy, and yeah, I, we're I both do Messi not like. Yeah, I do not like. I do not, not like uh, Ronaldo. Ronaldo. No. Nope. And he uh, he's made a lot of big news. So earlier this summer, uh, Lionel Messi left Barcelona to go to PSG, and now Cristiano Ronaldo leaving Juventus to go back to Manchester United, where he first kind of made his career back in the 2000s. And all I can say is I'm glad that he didn't choose Manchester City as a fake Manchester City fan because I, when I first got, not I don't even want to say got into soccer, but I just remember as a kid, I hated Manchester United just because they were always really good. Which you mean is kind you, of ironic you never because, liked Wayne Rooney? <laughs> no, no. And it's, it's kind of ironic because Manchester City is basically the new Manchester United. Uh, but yeah, if, if Ronaldo went to Man City, I would not root for them anymore. It wouldn't be like LeBron to the Celtics by any means, but it's uh, certainly <laughs> something that would be enough to make me not root for uh, a team anymore. So I'm glad Ronaldo and Manchester United. I don't really know how good they're going to be. Like, I don't know if there's a great comparison to this. I assume that he's uh, going to help them kind of become slightly more relevant than they have been in recent years. But uh, I'm certainly excited to root against him and probably see him more in the EPL because they're on TV a lot more than La Liga ever was or how Serie A in is, Italy. How, 36 years old. So I'd mm-hmm. imagine he's out of his prime. Unless of soccer, you can have long yeah. careers, right? No, I mean, he he's definitely on his... You know, coming close to his last legs. I don't know if there's a good comparison. Like, part of me wants to say LeBron going back to Cleveland, but he was way younger when he made his return there. LeBron so. going to LA? 
Yeah, but I guess yeah, maybe. I'm, I'm just trying, but like, just trying to think. Of I something. was trying to think of a comeback, just because Ronaldo was, um, he's going back to where he started. Right. Okay. With Manchester United. I, yeah, I can't think of one. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I am. Uh, I don't know if I'm gonna fully become invested in all this, but it's uh, it's definitely nice to have someone to root against. I will give Ronaldo a shout out because he became the highest selling jersey from a player when he switched teams, passing Messi when he went to PSG, as well as Brady with the Bucks and LeBron with the Lakers. It's crazy how, th- this is semi-off topic, but it's so crazy how much soccer players make. It, it, yeah, especially when you're a guy like Ronaldo. It, it is insane, like, how much money these guys cost just to be sold, and then you pay him a huge contract and, like, all the endorsements and stuff. Like, they're way up there when it comes to the highest-paid athletes. Is, is it true that Messi's contract, I think expired, but I think wasn't it like four years, six hundred million something? Yeah, like it was something insane. Yeah, when I first heard that, I'm like, that, that has to be a typo. <laughs> right? there, there's, there's no, no way. There's no way he makes that much. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, I yeah, mean, I mean, the best athletes in our country don't even make nearly that, and then all of a sudden I find out it wasn't a typo. And it's like, wow, we should have been soccer yep. players. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what Ronaldo. Um, I should probably have looked up those numbers. Uh, what he's getting from Manchester United, I'm sure that they're pretty crazy. It's two year contracts. Um, Oh, only 15 million euros. Oh, only. <laughs> oh, that's another thing. It's euros, <laughs> yeah, too. Well, so, like, so I'd imagine yeah. they'll, there, there's a difference, big difference in Yeah, but it's not significantly. Right. Oh. I don't know. His net worth is still 500 million, it that's looks so like. so absurd. In U.S. dollars. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so let's uh, let's talk about a sport maybe we're a little more knowledgeable about now, the NBA, particularly our Boston Celtics. So the last time we talked about the NBA was very early in free agency. The Celtics hadn't made any free agent signings, pretty limited moves this offseason. Since then, they've made some. What are your thoughts? Uh, you know, favorite move, least favorite move, whatever. I mean, favorite move, uh, I can't even think of one because I don't like any of the Celtics moves. Really? Well, I, no, I, I, I take it back. I mean, I like the... I like just they got rid of Kemba in his contract. I know that was so long ago, but I I actually did like that. Just given I th- I thought it would be a lot harder for the Celtics to get rid of Kemba and his bad contract, but just the fact that they got rid of him and and I, Al Horford he's not great anymore and his contract is bad as well. But he was a good leader when he was here. Yeah, so, I mean it helps that he's a former Celtic. Yeah, and back. so. I actually like that move, not because they got Al Horford more, way, way more because they were able to get rid of Kemba's contract. What about the point guard they brought in to replace some Dennis? Dennis Schroeder. So great, great value. It is for sure. But one year, five point nine million. But dollars. him and Marcus Smart on the same team, uh, you're asking for for a fight at some point. Those <laughs> those two on the same team, that that that's asking for trouble. <laughs> yeah, I I don't really know what the plan is going to be in terms of the guard position because I could see those two on the floor at the same time. I could see one of them as a starting point guard, the other as a backup. But it's uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, I can see that be- being problematic. Um, Josh Richardson is one where that, like that I don't... one was that one was all right. Like Josh it's... Richardson's a decent player, decent two guard. He's, but he's he's gotten so much worse the past two years. Like his three point shooting has dropped off significantly since he was traded from the Heat to the Seventy Sixers and the Jimmy Butler sign and trade. So uh, I'm not really optimistic. I'll admit I probably like think way much. too much of uh him in Miami. It's probably good name value. Like remember when remember <laughs> yeah. when Jeff Teague was brought in here last year? I'm like, oh wow, three oh, yeah. three million Same, for Jeff right? Teague? That's great. Yeah, and then and, and then all of a sudden you see him play. I'm like, oh, that's why he's only getting three million a year. He sucks now. <laughs> he won a and then he wins a title. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I do like the Juan Hearn Gomez trade. They just did uh, Chris Don Carson Edwards and a future second round pick. I don't, I I'll admit, I'm not. Good... I mean, I've seen him play a few. He's games, a big but... man. Yeah, yeah I mean, he'll I, add some value. I'm not there too familiar with his game i he was with the knicks right the grizzlies grizzlies okay. for him. well wasn't he didn't he used to play for the knicks or was that a di- was that a different hernan there were two hernan okay that's that's There's probably a one, mixed, a one that's probably one mixed up with the other I think one was with denver and minnesota right okay for most of his career all right so then i'm really not familiar with them then <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, they, they need um, big guys so I, I'm, they do i'll, I'll take so. it and chris dunn and carson edwards i'd imagine that they were not going to make a great impact yeah, yeah. So I'm. I guess I'm fine with it. 
Yeah, and I guess the way that I look at this offseason, when you look at, so the Richardson was extended a year. You also had Marcus Smart and Robert Williams extended in the future. I think that this team is kind of looking more ahead to next offseason. Um, you know, a lot of people are already thinking that the Celtics are making moves with the intention of making a big splash. Bradley Beal, his name's going to be connected to the Celtics a lot, especially with his uh, St. Louis friendship with Jason Tatum. Yeah, that, that's all I'm hoping for is for them to get Beal. They're not going to get any, they weren't going to get any superstar players to form a big three with 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 uh, with Tatum and, and Brown. And so, yeah, the plan, I'd imagine, plan A is to get Bradley Beal next offseason. And yeah, I, I, I'll admit, I'm not, I, I was not a fan of the Marcus Smart extension. Is, is, I, is he, yes, yeah, he's I a good player, but either. oh man, nearly twenty million a year for Marcus Smart. I just if if he's your third best player, you're not you're not gonna win anything. You you, you might as well have you know the banners that they have with of all the championships they have. They might yeah. as well have seven seed banners uh, for the next <laughs> few years because that's all they're gonna I, do if if they can't get Beal or other superstars and they're just gonna roll out the same basically the same roster and have those three guys. Uh, as the big three, and I like Tatum and Brown, and Smart's fine, but he's not a uh, a superstar caliber player. He's a uh, a decent uh, starter, but a great bench piece on a championship team, but not a not a big three kind of kind of player. I agree with that assessment. I'm a big fan of Marcus Smart as a player, but you know, in a a lesser role when it comes to you know having championship aspirations. I do like the Robert Williams locking him up though. Um, that one, I'm I feel not, like it's that one. I'm not. I don't hate or love because I can see the upside with Robert Williams. It's just that his problem is staying healthy and yeah, he hasn't really so proven it's definitely that. definitely a huge and risk. So uh, yeah, there's a definitely a risk reward with that move. Yeah. I mean, it'll either look really great or, or, or really, bad. really bad. So that's, yeah. that's my assessment I, on it. I'm is leaning that... more toward really great. Okay. So, and I'm, I'll be ca- like what you always say, cautiously optimistic yeah, with Robert right? Williams. It's a, it's a great phrase. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, all right, let's uh, let's talk a little baseball, and let's specifically talk about the New York Mets. Now, at this point, this is kind of older news, but the Mets have been in the headlines basically since the start of the offseason, uh, whether it's bringing a new owner, you know, trading for Francisco Lindor, having a GM fired a month after being hired for uh, you know being a giant creep. You had them celebrating the World Series during spring training and throughout the season things have been kind of up and down with them they look to be in a great spot heading into the all-star break and they just kind of collapse out of the gates they went out and traded for Javi Baez at the deadline and we're just horrible in August with things kind of reaching a low moment when Baez and Lindor in reaction to fans Mets fans booing them decided to boo the crowd by giving thumbs down so i guess what is your your take on that i mean like, i think, you it's, think childish. it's a huge deal <laughs> i think it is as well but do you think it's like a giant deal not as... really I, I just think it's just a little childish and they should know that when you when you're in a team that's in a big market like new york even though you're not the yankees you're still in new york in a big market and there's big expectations when you're in a big market and you should get booed if if you deserve it does that make sense? It just Oh yeah, I mean I think most athletes recognize that. So it is uh it's not a good good look for them playing in a big market like that. Two guys. I mean, Bias came from Chicago. I don't know that it's that much different, but Lindor did come from Cleveland. Um but yeah, the the Mets decided to what I think was an overreaction, put out a statement, say we're going to talk to the players, and I was like, "All right, this is just totally ruining things." And Bias, it's like so He's going to be a free agent. He's trying to make a ton of money. So it's not a great look when you're kind of showing teams that have the money to spend in the big markets that you might not be able to handle it. Uh, At the same time, I don't think that it is like I think that the Mets handled it very poorly the way that they reacted to it, that it's just it's hurting everybody. It's not even just hurting bias at this point. And I don't know what to make of uh, his prospects returning to New York. I don't know what to make of his chances in free agency. I'm sure the Cubs would love to have him back if they do, you know, decide to go that route. Um, but it, I do think there are a lot of crazy takes. Like, do you think the Mets should have 
cut him right away, no. like a lot of people are saying. Yeah, <laughs> Keith Olbermann, Tony Kornheiser, they were both saying that. I was like, that's ridiculous. Like at least that's, that's a, crazy from them. I like those guys. Yeah, get a I know, get a qualifying offer slapped on him. Get something in free agency. I mean, you gave up like a top ten prospect in your organization for him. Um, so it's yeah, it's it, it's uh, it's been downhill for the Mets in the second half of the year. Obviously, I was big on them, but a lot of that had to do with their starting rotation and ever since the Grom has been hurt it's been downhill because they're in first place for a decent chunk of the year and a lot of that of course had to do with the Grom but now it's been reported that he has a partially torn UCL in his elbow Tommy John surgery yeah so yeah it's not looking good for him now no they uh injuries have played this team all year and uh you know we already talked about losing one gm well they just might have lost another gm zach scott uh caught with dwi apparently leaving a party at steve cohen the owner's house that just add another storyline to the mets yeah um, they're this past week it's not gonna get any better for them this year well here's the thing though in the midst of all this happening they've won seven of their last nine games they're back to 500 so it's like that's just I feel like that wraps up this Mets team so perfectly is as as much as they're still like associated with the pre Cohen days with the Will Ponds and just all these like things that only happened to them. They're still a really talented baseball team that, you know, they're, they're a only long f- shot to make the playoffs. Only but, four games out. That, that's- yeah, they're only four games out. They've won seven of their last nine games. They're they're battling back into it, which is just it's incredible to me, like with all this going on, that they're still finding ways to win games. Like I thought for sure that the uh the trains were long off the tracks, but apparently they're not. And they have it. They actually have know. a better shot of winning the division than they do of getting the second wild card at this point. Yeah, they do because the the Padres and the Reds, I think, have um, you know better records than the Braves, who are in first. Yep, right? Exactly. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't think they'll make the playoffs. I think the Mets are still going to have to make some moves this offseason, but it is crazy just like how inconsistent their season has been. And, uh, you know, even at their lows, they're still finding ways to have highs at times. And even at their highs, they're still finding ways to have lows. It's a wacky season for them. Yep. All right, last uh, sports topic of the episode. Let's talk some golf. And Patrick Cantlay wins the FedEx Cup, $15 million prize. Does that mean he's the 2021 PGA Tour champion? I I hate the golf. I hate the format that they have right now with with the FedEx Cup. Uh, yeah, Tour Championship format where whoever's leading in points they get this one or two. I think it's a two stroke lead over the second place guy. I think I think it's yeah. Dumb. That's what Cantley had coming Just in. Think of if you were Tiger Woods in your heyday in I think it was like two thousand when you're 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 winning basically every golf tournament. You're just destroying everybody, and then all of a sudden, when it comes to the Tour Championship or the FedEx Cup winner, you're only two strokes ahead. <laughs> I, I think so. I, so, so I had so thought absurd. that it was based on like total strokes or something. I didn't know that it was only two strokes ahead, like I, I, regardless of how many points. Or it might be one stroke ahead. I don't have it in front of me, but it's no. He he did come in two strokes. Ahead uh, so it of, is at two least strokes. Ahead of John okay. Rom. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. Which like John Rom was. John Rahm and Patrick Cantley are both against the format, and John Rahm found out he had like the best weekend there, and he's like, I had no idea. That's what because... I'm saying. Like he he should be the winner. Uh, with I don't know how it works <laughs> with the with the FedEx Cup and the Tour Championship. It's so yeah. it's so crazy now. It, it used to be a point system, and I don't know if I love that format, but it's better than the one they have right now. Where if John Rahm is scoring better than Cantley, then he sh- he should have been the winner then. And and not can't lay, but uh, I don't I don't know. It, it, it's yeah, Rom still took home five million. I mean, that's that's place. nice. It's, it's a lot. Yeah. A lot it's of... not fifteen. No, can't lay in his career had less than fifteen million career winnings going into this one tournament, and he yeah, and he and, and then he, he all of a sudden like he got hot 6. of late, and, yeah. he, and he he won several tournaments this year, and so yeah, I mean, he had that epic uh, six hole playoff win over Bryson DeChambeau the week before at the yep. BMW, and he he also so. beat Morikawa. In a playoff, I forgot what tournament it was. I think it was Memorial. I don't remember what tournament, but that's not. He did win the Memorial. It was so Memorial. Okay, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing I didn't know about Cantlay was that he was like a like a golf superstar in college at UCLA. Yeah, um, turned pro in twenty twelve. Yep. and then he had a back injury. He missed two years. He, he missed. Yep, exactly. He missed a couple of seasons, and so he was a stud coming on to the t- before getting on the tour, and then he missed a couple of years, and then now he's finally breaking out. Uh, as one of the 
best golfers on tour course after winning the FedEx Cup. Yeah, yeah. I don't think that I had really heard of him before the uh, 2020 match. He's he's definitely he was my pick to win. He's based definitely on a few articles I read. I, I gotta tell you, he's out of all the stud elite golfers, he's got to be the most boring one of all of them. He shows yeah he, barely any emotion. I know I was watching him, um, you know, on Sunday with the win, and he, he definitely did not. He's he's not like Rom or Bryson where they're they're fist pumping after great putts. It's it's yeah. it's just straight up like All right. Yep, yeah. Move nice. on to the next hole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I I mean it's good for him. Um so is the Ryder Cup happening this year? I think so, yeah. I, it would so it definitely soon, I sh- right? I'm glad it got canceled last year. There's no way. The whole point of the Ryder Cup is the the a big thing about it is the the fan experience. Mm-hmm. There was no vaccine last year, and having all those people that, that that just could not have happened. It it took it took uh way too long to can, to postpone it. Uh, I remember it watching it in I think it was in France in 2018, and the uh, the English fans were just going crazy. They they all had beers. They were all very drunk and uh, enjoying what they saw. So it is happening September 24th through 26th at Whistling Straits in uh, Haven, Wisconsin. Yeah, I, I, so. I'd imagine the that US won't won't be that great since they usually aren't. Yeah, it would be nice to see us pull out the win. Definitely looking forward to that one. We'll certainly be talking about it on here. Um all right, that'll wrap up the sports talk and let's get into a little pop culture. Um just a few topics to get to and let's start with uh some music. We had Kanye West finally dropped his album Donda after what felt like over a month of him doing album release parties and then Drake this past weekend dropped Certified Lover Boy. So, did you listen to any all of either album? I didn't listen to Drake's yet. I did listen to Kanye's and I'll admit, I I don't care for it. I I'm still going to listen to his past albums like uh, My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy or Graduation or Late Registration or College Dropout. I'll listen to o- old Kanye stuff, but I'll admit, I, I, I listened to some of it. I didn't care for it. I'll admit, I, I know I'm not in the in the rap as much as you, but I do listen I mean, to even it. Even then, I'm not that much yeah. more into it. Yeah. Well, I know you're you're a Kanye yeah, fan, and so I was, I was I, kind of curious I don't, what I don't, your thoughts would I don't be. love Drake, but I, I'm, I'm definitely a Kanye fan, and I'll admit, like, I listen to more of the old Kanye music than his most recent stuff, and yeah, I listened to some of his recent album, and I didn't care for it. Yeah, I uh, the first time I listened to Donda, I think... I made it through five, six songs before being like, this is unlistenable. I just <laughs> yeah, that, didn't like it that, at all. And That was kind of my thought, but I just, you definitely just went straight well, to the point. <laughs> so I, I've, I've since listened to more of it and like, yeah, there are a few songs that I like, but he, they're 27. So yeah, odds are he's going to have at least five that are like somebody is going to like, but I don't know. I, uh, I haven't enjoyed his, his recent mu- music as much as his old stuff. I did like The Life of Pablo a lot. That one was 2016, so somewhat recent. Um, and it's probably my third favorite. There are, after... cu- there are a couple. I think Waves. I think Waves yeah, right. is my favorite. Huh. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a big fan of um, FML, which is a song he does with The Weeknd. And then I can't think of the name of it. Um, he has a song with The Weeknd on this album that I do enjoy. Kind of, I mean, compared to the others, but yeah, for the most part, I'm not, I don't love it. And it does take me a while to like really appreciate albums, um, especially rap albums. Uh, I can't get into them right on the first listen and see, I'm scrolling through. I have no idea because on Spotify, he only credits himself, but um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's, there's a few of them, like the jails are pretty good, but uh, you know, part one and part two, which the uh, jail part two had some uh, issues. Universal apparently wasn't going to release it, but it's it's finally listenable on Spotify. Um, also, just a black square as a cover. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I was wondering that. T- I, I was wondering if there was a glitch on my phone or no. or if it really was the, the picture and it, it was the picture <laughs> when no, I first and the saw thing- that. Yeah, so that is, um, first of all, it's not original. Uh, this is Spinal Tap, a movie from like 1984. They had a joke that the album that they were releasing and they were going on tour for was just going to be a black square. Like, what is this? Uh, yeah, and of course, Kanye is like, no, this is my image, creativity. Uh, but even then, it's probably a better album cover than Certified Lover Boy. You have think you, so? Have you seen it? 
No, but I, 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 I've seen the yeah, Dondo. I mean, look it up right now. <laughs> it's a course, yeah, look, a picture of a black. Uh, yeah, no, look up the Certified Lover Boy. I know you're not as big. Oh a fan of yeah, Drake as I, I am. have seen that. Yeah, yeah. you probably what see the heck memes is that? of it. Right? <laughs> Just a bunch of is that, is like that, pregnant women yeah, emojis, different I, ethnicities. Yeah, I and saw colors, the, like, I saw the joke uh, on someone's Twitter. I think it was like an NFL memes one where it's like, "Huh, this is Philip Rivers' wife every year." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's uh yeah yeah i, yeah, I, I, don't I did really see that that one's on absurd one. what, yeah what? i don't love the idea of using emojis on an album cover in general and that one um, and yeah I, uh, emojis yeah is definitely dumb but then this is just what is this yeah and i think for the most part i do like drake's album better but he also has a few songs where i'm just like Ugh. like so he has a song called girls want girls where he's just like said you a lesbian girl me too and i'm just like what are you going for there does he's coming out as a lesbian like all right drake uh i and the thing is i think that i enjoy the beat of it it's a catchy song but it makes me kind of uncomfortable to listen to at the same time which definitely takes away from it uh we finally got the long awaited sequel to yolo you only live twice featuring lil wayne and rick ross i, I do actually like that one and he also has a song with kid cuddy that's pretty good Overall, I'm not a fan of really either album, um, at least immediately. We'll see if anything changes the more I listen to them. Yeah, but that's I, kind of how I, I normally I haven't listened to any of uh, Drake's most recent album. I just saw the, <laughs> the picture of the album, yeah. the album cover. Yeah, that one's absurd. I, you, you definitely like Drake more than I do, but there are a couple, there are a few songs on each album that, that I like. I mean, I was looking at his past albums, like, like Views. I liked, uh, one dance and controller those are just a couple examples and then and then nothing what was it uh nothing was the same yeah like he has i think it was starting starting from the bottom or started from the bottom that that was a decent song wait so those are the songs that you like i thought those are the ones you hated no those ones are fine i'm uh like and then zero to a hundred and yeah uh, yolo headlines and take care like that that one's that one's good um there's just a couple songs in each album i'm like yeah that one they're good, but I'll admit, you definitely like Drake more than I do. Yeah, I guess my my thing is I enjoy like some maybe like, I don't know, more up-tempo type songs. Like, you know, you'd kind of like turn up to them at a party. And the reality is that's not what most rap music is. So for me, it's hard to listen to an album and be like, oh, yeah, like immediately, like I love this song. It just takes me a while. So... Early on reviews, though, as I'm not a big fan of either album, I would give the edge to Certified Lover Boy over Donda, but I think that's mostly because I'm more partial to Drake than I am to Kanye. And I would love if anyone's listening, like, to kind of explain to me, like, you know, why these albums are better than I think they are. Maybe point to certain uh, songs I, I, and like try to get me to appreciate I mean, them more because I just I just haven't been able to in my limited listen so far. I mean, for Drake, uh, you can convince me just because I'm not a huge Drake fan, but for Kanye, you can't convince me. His his old albums are are great. Oh, for sure. Great. Which and, I think most people that are Kanye fans would also admit to that, like. They would agree that his older stuff is better than a lot yeah, of his newer I, I, stuff. I in still, the best I still listen to his older stuff, especially "Graduation" and "My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy." Like, yeah, those are my two favorite albums of his. And then, of course, so. I still, I also still listen to Kid Cudi and the the Man on the Moon albums that he had, like his his older stuff. But I don't mm-hmm. his his newer albums are kind of just whatever. But so it's yeah. pretty, basically the same thing for any rapper really where it's like i listen to older stuff but not really new yeah stuff. like i j cole is one where i love 2014 forest well, I lo- yeah and then that's the same exact- eyes only i did not like it all i have the same I exact think opinion. even another album that i i just didn't even give a chance to yeah so. 2014 forest hills drive i def that's definitely my favorite it j. might cole. be my favorite album in general oh in general wow um, it's, it's definitely it's, it's definitely my there. favorite i'd have to think a lot it's more definitely about my it, favorite j cole there. album for sure yeah um, all right, let's uh, let's move on and let's talk some uh, Netflix. So they uh, recently released a remake of the 1999 teen drama or teen romantic comedy "She's All That," uh, and it's "He's All That" starring Addison Rae, uh, the famous TikTok star, as well as Tanner Buchanan in the "He's" role of it. Uh, I'm guessing you haven't watched it. Nope. And I'll say, I will not recommend it. Uh, my mom basically made us watch it as a family movie night. And I have never seen She's All That. 
So she's all that. Um, it's considered like a cult classic, basically, like one of the the staples of the uh, the teen romantic comedy. It was nineteen ninety nine. Rachel Lee Cook, Freddie Prince Jr. Um, I'm surprised I haven't seen it. I'm a, I'm a big rom- it's yeah. I'm, I'm a big romantic you comedy guy, so I'm surprised. I know. Well, so basically, what the original was is the guy gets dumped by his girlfriend for like I don't know some famous pop star or whatever he's supposed to be like the coolest guy in school and he decides to have a project where he's going to uh remake this like artsy girl you know kind of a loser into like a prom queen and they decide to make it he's all that where addison ray they they swip they swap it it's a gender reverse role and she does that with the kind of loser guy to make him prom king after her pop star boyfriend breaks up with him her uh, it, it's such a ridiculous movie. One of my so the, the original one, forty one percent on Rotten Tomatoes. This one only got a thirty one percent. Very widely panned. I think anyone who had any expectations for it is uh, not going to enjoy it. Um, one of my favorite parts of the movie is how much product placement there's in it. So in one of the early scenes, there, uh, you know, all the girls are sitting around a table drinking core water, just very prominently on the screen. And uh, there's a scene where they all go to like a karaoke party and they show up and they're like, oh, let's have some free Pizza Hut. And then on the way out is, hey, can I take this bucket of KFC home with me? Just getting all the Yum! brands in there. I'm pretty sure Pepsi, who is like their part with Yum! brands, Frito-Lay, Pepsi's all in it. They have like smart food, Sun Chips, like whatever Pepsi did, they're somehow involved in this movie. There's a, a ton of scenes with bounty paper towels. Uh, she's looking at Old Navy um the guy's sister and then i don't know any of the makeup brands but they're very much prominently shown in uh in this because that's one thing is addison ray she's a social media influencer in the movie just like she is in real life so um i thought that was that was pretty funny just like how in your face they were about the product placement in the movie have you ever seen the movie clueless i've heard of it but i haven't there's actually a seen th- it. it's it's not it, it's kind of apples and oranges but there's some similarity where the the popular girl in the movie notices a new student who's definitely not popular and kind of awkward. And she tries to teach her how to be cool and, and try to be a uh, part of the popular crowd. If I'm if, yeah, there's, so, so there's some similarity. To that. I, similar. Yeah. Okay. That, that it, it kind yeah. of reminded me of that a little. I it was a movie yeah. I saw recently. Interesting. When is that from? It's like an older. It's it's an right? older one. It came out in like the nineties. Okay, so like the same time frame. Yeah, era. Um, and then one last comment. So, do you know the actress Madison Pettis? No. Um, she was. was you watched Corey in the House, right? No, I, I did day? not. No. No. What about yeah, I know you did, but plan? I didn't. What about the movie The Game Plan with The Rock? Oh, I've seen that. Oh, that's yeah, her. So you remember his the daughter, his daughter? the the daughter yeah. of Peyton? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pey- Peyton. That's yeah. yeah. I, I okay. So that's her. I don't know that I'd seen her as a, you know, an adult. She's 23 now, but I got to say like she's definitely uh she's she's come a long way since her days as a, a Disney child star. Um I don't know. That makes me feel you know, old. Just after yeah, googling, oh, it is. after googling her. Yeah. That makes me feel Yeah, old. and seeing her now. Yeah, I mean she has to be up there in terms of like one of the uh <laughs> the biggest uh glow-ups from uh former Disney Channel stars. So I uh, was very happy to be introduced to her, and I guess I'll leave it at that. <laughs> um, all right, so that'll uh, that'll wrap up some of our uh, you know non sports talk. Uh, we'll finish off with the top five. So NFL season is about to start, one of the best times of the year, and uh, that got us thinking: why don't we count down our favorite weeks of the year in this episode's? Top five. Not two, not three, not four. Top five, top five, top five. All right, so best weeks of the year. I'll get started with my number five because this is what inspired this list, NFL week one. Uh, I I love the start of football season. It's something I'll always be excited for. The weather's turning into fall, which is my favorite season, and football is a big part of it. So it's always exciting after a long seven months without any uh, professional football to have it back. You get a little bit of a taste with college football week one, but here you are, NFL week one. Not only does your team have you know a chance, doesn't matter who you are, you can always go into the season feeling optimistic, uh, but you also have your fantasy team 
the start of that, feeling optimistic about it. So there's a lot of reasons to love week one. That that Sunday, just wall to wall action, just watching Red Zone the whole day. There's just nothing better than it. And you know, in terms of the whole week, you get game on Thursday night. You get a game. Used to be two games. You got one game on Monday night football. So um, definitely had to make my list at number five. That's a great choice. Uh, for my number five, I went with Halloween. And I know that's just a specific day, not a week, but I actually really do enjoy that week. Not And Halloween is definitely a big part of it. It's it's honestly my favorite holiday. I, I, just, really? Just the the idea of just dressing up in some crazy costume and getting candy, uh, that, that's that's all I could ask for in a holiday. I yeah. Um, so even though it's a childish holiday, probably, compared to the other ones, like... Uh, I mean, it's it can definitely be a fun adult holiday. Yeah, I, I, it's definitely the best, so... That's yeah. Halloween's definitely a big part of it, but I also like that time of the year because not just because of Halloween, but also the World Series is on and sometimes the Red Sox are in it, which is great. And uh this year Halloween is gonna be on Sunday, which is during football, which is pretty cool as well. Yep. And and football during that time of the year is in uh mid season form, which is I mean, any time is great for football, but uh mid-season form is is great and so yeah that's why it's number five yeah october might be my favorite um sports month of the year the baseball playoffs is a big reason why football you get basketball and hockey starting up um but yeah that's that's certainly a great time that last week with halloween and you know halloween party is uh, definitely a fun thing to do even as an adult still enjoying it uh, probably even more as a kid for me so good choice of year number five there my number four is christmas week and Christmas is probably my favorite holiday. Um, but I think one thing I'll say about Christmas is I almost feel like the excitement, you know, the holiday season, the ramp up for it is better than the day itself. And Christmas week, you really get, you know, the, the best of that. You have your holiday parties, you're spending a ton of time with family. I probably see more family during the week before Christmas than I do any other time of the year. Gift exchanges, it's just like a great time. Um, you be very happy, merry, lots of eating, lots of drinking, especially in my family. Um, but there's also some stress that comes with it, especially if you're a last minute shopper like I tend to be. So that's kind of the reason why it's a little lower on this list, uh, despite you know the, it being the most wonderful time of the year. I love Christmas. Um, definitely the week of Christmas has to be in my top five best weeks of the year. And for my number four, it is also the exact same choice as you had. I put Christmas week and I do agree with you that the build up to Christmas, I think, is better than Christmas. I enjoy Christmas Day. I like it. Yeah, I mean, it's a good day, but I, th- I think last year it was worse than usual, as, just because yeah. it, obvious reasons, just not uh-huh. being able to do much. I know. I, I hope that it's not as a, a concern this year. Yeah, uh, I, I, I definitely like Christmas. Of course, like I'd imagine a lot of other people. I, as a kid, of course, it's all about getting the presents and getting. Mm-hmm. The PlayStation or Xbox and other nice stuff, but yeah, as as I gotten older, I I definitely like I, I pride myself in getting good presents, whether if it's the yeah. family or friends. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I know it's kind of a dumb thing to take pride in, but I don't know. I I like I don't know. As I gotten older, I I feel more obligated to give more presents than than give. No, and that that's huge. Yeah. I, I that is a big part of it. And I agree with that as an adult. It's it's not even just about the receiving, it's also about the giving. That's a big part of that time of year. So definitely makes sense. Um my number three kind of personal to me. Um, you know, maybe not everyone can relate to it, uh, but hopefully enough people listening can, and that is uh summer vacation week. So for a lot of people, it's, I don't know, the week of the 4th of July, you take off, you go to the beach, you go to the, the lake, mountains somewhere. Some people, they wait later in the summer, in August. My family would always rent, and still do, always rent a beach house at uh, Hampton Beach in Northampton, New Hampshire for a week, always a week after the 4th of July. So uh, it's a great time to be up there. It's, you know, that's still very much hot and uh, it's, it's so much fun just hanging out with, um, you know, my family, family, friends, people that I really see for the most part, just that one week every year. And it's nice to just have a week off work, especially in the middle of the summer. Nobody wants to be working. Um, so it's, it's a great time to be able to come up here, um, come up to New Hampshire and, uh, 
you know, just enjoy my time up here, especially compared to when I'm up here around the holidays and it's cold during the winter. I was going to say, when I saw that you put summer vacation week, I was going to say, wouldn't you want to just put 4th of July weekend? But Yeah, well, 4th of July has never been like a huge thing for me. So that's why it's kind of keeping it generic. Right. Again, a lot of people, that's probably what it is, the 4th of July week. But for me, it's a specific vacation, which is always right after. Right. Okay. Uh, So for my number three, I went with the start of March Madness. And even though I'm not huge on college basketball, I mean, like I don't know every single player on every single team, but I do love March Madness. I do love the tournament. And the best part is the the start of it before the tournament starts when you're building your brackets and you got all this fake confidence that you think you're going to make the perfect bracket and then you'll you'll yeah. be dead by the the first or second day. <laughs> uh-huh. So, I I love I love that week. I waste so much time not working and just <laughs> building brackets and uh of and thinking that I'm going to uh nail a a sleeper pick and it ends up just losing in the first round anyway. And some year, some years I'll have success in, in call it in in brackets, but then there'll be some years where I I I'm just done by the first weekend, but even so it's still, it's still fun. And seeing how many crazy upsets there are, especially that first weekend of college, college basketball in the tournament is it's, it's the best. Yeah. It's an awesome week. And that's why it's my number two. And you're right. The uh, build up is almost better than the actual tournament itself with your filling out the brackets. And it starts with selection Sunday. Uh, always one of the best days of the year. You have all the conference tournaments wrap up. Got to tune into CBS at six o'clock, see how the bracket fills out, and then you get four days of going back and forth in your head over how your brackets are gonna look, and you know who you think's gonna make a deep run, who's getting upset early. You get the first four games to kind of your little appetizer um, right before they start, and then Thursday, Friday, just wall to wall action. So many games going on all at once. It's awesome, especially if you can uh, take some time off work to be able to you know enjoy them without any distractions and then even going into the weekend with the second round there's still plenty of games to watch so uh, for me it's it's my favorite sport. it it might be my least productive week of the year (laughs) oh yeah it definitely (laughs) one of one of one of my least yeah at least for a week where i'm working most of the time certainly my, my least productive week yeah um and then so for my number two i'm i'm going with master's week i love Masters week. It uh, as someone that's of course uh, as big of a fan as the PJ Tour as I am, the mas- Masters is the granddaddy of them all, and I I love I love that tournament. And not every not every single year does it live up to the hype. Like the the last couple years have been just okay, uh, but of course the Tiger year was amazing. And other yeah, other well, you had the one in November with no fans. yeah that, that, I, mean, I guess last one's in the the either, one so. yeah that one was a little bit of a letdown and just way too easy for the the players but i mean it was nice to see dustin yeah. johnson uh have as much emotion uh as he had after he won but but yeah last year the the past one of montiano winning it, it wasn't great but it it was cool that he won for his country and it was nice to see fans back and even if it doesn't live up to the hype it's still the build up to the masters is so is always gonna be great and yeah, and you get like the par three tournament during it. I know people love going for the whole week. Have you been to Augusta yet? No, but I would. I would certainly would love to one day. Yeah, it, it's cra- it's it crazy expensive, and I think it's. I, I I've heard it's also really hard to even just get tickets. And oh, I know you have to get tickets yeah. to be able to get in. I think you can still go during the week, right? I th- or do you? I, is it tickets for the whole I, week? I, I th- no, I think it's just for one yeah. day. I, I'm, I'm okay. guess I don't know. I'll admit I don't know. Of course I haven't. I know there's a lottery system for it, yeah. so that's that's how hard it is to get there. And you talked uh, about how for NFL Week One, one of the reasons why you love fall the most is because mm-hmm. of NFL Week One. And I'll admit, when it came to when we did the five question segment on uh, which which one's your favorite season or rank your favorite seasons, I I'm sticking with winter last, but the other three seasons are interchangeable. But the reason why at the, at the time why I said spring first is because of how great that week is, and it's not just because of the Masters. That, that's definitely the biggest reason, but it's also the start of the NHL playoffs. And even though I'm not great, as high on baseball as I used to be, I it's still exciting when it's just starting up. 
like opening yep. day. That's around. That's the week before the Masters, but it's that that time frame is, in my opinion, one of the best, if not the best, sports times of the year. Yeah, I will say like October is my favorite sports month, but March and April are right behind at two and three right. because you know March Madness and then April with the yeah, start it, of that's another thing. Mar- and NBA NHL playoffs. The Masters, that's another thing. So. March Madness is just ending with the national championship being yep. at the beginning of April. So that 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 mm-hmm. time of the year is so great. Yeah, yeah, big fan of it. Uh, but it's not my favorite time of the year. My number one week of the year is Thanksgiving week, and. There are a few reasons for this one. I guess, you know, going back to days in school, it was a two week, two day school week, uh, whether you were in, you know, us growing up or into college and you just got had to get through those two days when you were younger, probably not as uh, stressful when you get older. Maybe you have a bunch of exams, projects that your teacher or professor try to cram into those two days, but then you get three days off. Now, as a, a working person, I usually work the Wednesday before. But that Wednesday night as an adult is Thanksgiving Eve, which is the biggest bar night of the year across the country. Everyone wants to go out, catch up with their old friends from school and know that even if they're hungover, they got a huge meal waiting for them the next day on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, My personal Thanksgiving Eve experience is usually going to the bars with my parents and their friends at 5 p.m. We're like the first ones in the door. By the time anyone else my age is going out, I've already had enough to drink that I'm good to go home. Um... But it doesn't end there because, of course, you have Thanksgiving Day. You have some football on it. I know a lot of people kind of get bored with the Lions and the Cowboys, especially when they're not as great. But I, I still love the food. It's still awesome for Thanksgiving Day in general. Um, and then Friday, college football starts. Saturday, college football. It's rivalry week. It's some of the biggest games of the year. Not even just South Carolina, Clemson, from a personal perspective. You got the Iron Bowl. You got Michigan, Ohio State. All of the big rivalries. And then Saturday night. Something at least you and I can experience is the holiday stroll in Nashville. I call it Nashville Super Bowl. It's my favorite night of the year in Nashville. They already canceled it for this year, which I'm very disappointed. I hope that they still do something or at least, you know, the bars are open or whatever, because it's it's the best night. Like Thanksgiving Eve is a preview for the holiday stroll. Everybody's still out that night. And, uh, you know, couple it with all of the football games going on just makes for an amazing week. Yeah, the holiday stroll is definitely when it happens on Saturday is definitely fun. And uh I mean, I didn't have it on my list, but it definitely uh <laughs> made me think twice about it even though you definitely like Thanksgiving more than I do. I <laughs> made it pretty clear that Thanksgiving <laughs> Yeah. not my You're not, as big not my favorite holiday and I have definitely a limited food choice <laughs> when it comes yeah, to Thanksgiving. I get that. Maybe that uh-huh. maybe I can upgrade the food choices in the future on Thanksgiving though. Yeah, when you're finally an adult. <laughs> Which will never happen, so that means <laughs> never. <laughs> uh-huh. All right, so for my number one, it was on your list already. You talked about it. NFL week one is basically porn for me. <laughs> it is it's it is yeah. the best. It, I mean, when it comes to football, yeah, when it's j- end of July, early August, it's like, oh, man, football's about to be starting. I got to do all this research on who's going to be on my fantasy teams and 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 also the excitement of my own teams and whether I mean there might be a little bit less excitement now that now that Brady's not with the Patriots anymore but there's still plenty of buzz around the team and and just the NFL in general and I love the the first week with football being back cuz I live I basically basically in the fall and winter I just live for football uh and we Anyone who's a listener uh, knows how much we both love football, and having that week one is so great. Seeing all the seeing all the games, especially week one, because you get free Sunday NFL NFL Sunday ticket. But true for for yeah. week for the first week though. But either mm-hmm. way, I'd probably still watch a bunch of NFL Red Zone as well. Uh, yep. So love NFL week one. That's why it's number one. Yeah, I uh, I mean, it's my favorite time of the football season. Everything is still at play. You don't know how the rest of it's going to play out. Um, I will say that when we first came up with this idea, uh, I think there was a little bit of a miscommunication because oh, I yeah. log on to <laughs> input my choices and all of yours are just football related. Right. So I'm like, okay, either Brian didn't understand the prompt or he's just insane. Yeah. I, his entire I, life is just yeah, football. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't understand the prompt. I'll admit when I first 
put it down, I was thinking, does he mean just in general or does he mean just football related? So I go, I went with football related just to see how your list yeah. would look. But then while I was, when I, all of a sudden when I saw your list have actually normal things and non-sports related, I'm like, yeah. all right, it's not football. But then I thought to myself, hey, maybe these are my five favorite weeks. Maybe I'm just that yeah. much into football. Uh, you know what's better than Christmas week? The NFL draft week. Yeah. You know, nothing better than just reading mock drafts for 72 oh, I, straight hours only to watch Bill Belichick trade his first round pick for a second and a future third. See, that's why I was number five on my list because <laughs> because of Bill Belichick would just eventually trade the pick. But I feel like because yeah. the Patriots are going to stink more now, maybe not stink, but that's a little bit too harsh. But you know what I mean. They're not going to be as elite yeah, as they used to be. To they might to. be earlier in the drafts now, and I might actually need to pay a little bit more attention on who's who's going in the yeah. first round and so i'll admit as as i've gotten older i'll admit i i've actually liked the draft more than i used to even though yeah, there's I mean, still I... part of me and probably part of you that thinks like bill burr where it's like oh oh the jets are up next no i mean i i enjoy the draft as well but i'm not gonna say that it's better than i mean when it comes to football though holidays, like that like, I, yeah, yeah i mean sure you're kind of limited if you just say your top five football weeks mine probably looks similar to yours so yeah. Uh, I just thought that was hilarious seeing that because I was like, I think that this is not a legitimate list, but there's a chance that he's actually being. If there were football, here. that it would be. Yeah. Um, all right, that'll wrap up this episode. We'll definitely be talking a lot more football in the coming weeks, and uh, you know, probably some other sports, but that's certainly going to be the main topic of our future episodes. So, for my co-host Brian Wells, I'm Corn Thanks, everyone.